producing healthy, nutrient-dense food for people is a wonderful thing. And that's what we do. <laughs> we spend all winter working on the soil and then comes the harvest and we're busy right now picking and packing and sending off the fruit, the rewards from our labour. This is The Producers. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The Yachacha has been domestically cultivated for centuries in the tropical lowlands of the Amazon basin. But after being introduced to the tropical fruit by a friend, Helen Hill and her husband Bruce set about creating the world's first commercial plantation in far north Queensland, and the world is taking note. Well, we've, we're growing a tropical fruit, so of course we're in the tropics, but we're called the dry, dry tropics, although you wouldn't think so this morning because we had an enormous downpour <laughs> and uh, we're in the midst of our harvest. So we're about 45 kilometres south of Townsville um, <clears throat> and um, we're in a region called the Burdekin, and it's mostly sugarcane, but there are other things that are grown here as well. So we're a pretty, new, we're a newbie in the area. We've only been here, well, 20 years. <laughs> yeah. So we've been producing fruit for the last 11, um, and the truck came this morning and took off pallets for Brisbane Sydney, Melbourne, and also we've sent to Cambodia this week. Suited to the tropical climate of Australia's north, Helen is growing a South American staple. We're, we're growing a fruit called the achacha. Um, it comes from the Amazon basin. It's a tropical fruit. It's related. It's a garcinia related to mangosteen. That more more people have heard about mangosteen than they have about achacha. So, we were actually the first commercial um, plantation in the world. Um, <clears throat> so we had to market the name and market the fruit, which is probably the most difficult thing we've done. So to get, to get the name out of a new fruit is not really easy, but this year's been the easiest so far. After an old friend convinced them that Achacha would be ideal for Australia's tropical north, Helen and her husband changed careers and put their hands in the soil to build the foundations of the plantation. We had a friend from the Amazon basin from Bolivia who was desperate to have his uh, fruit grown here in Australia. And um, we sort of put him off for years because we're not farmers. We, Bruce was lecturing at the ANU and I was... I did uh, fine art, so it's not a very good background for <laughs> for, for growing fruit. However, um, we've done it, and um, we we got somehow I managed to find a a, a video co or a film called "One Man, One Cow, One Planet" about biodynamic growing, and our initial grower had spent all our funds on herbicides and pesticides because nobody knew how to grow this fruit. So he was, he was having difficulty. So once I saw that film, One Man, One Cow, One Planet, I realised that biodynamic was a way of growing at a very low cost. So we started doing that about 14 years ago. And it's a slow way of adding biology to your soil, improving the soil health. And so by improving the soil health, you can improve the tree and fruit and people health. So that's what we've been doing. And this year, finally, we have a bumper crop and the fruit is bigger. So it's all started to pay off. When we decided that we really needed to go organic, um, we had a grower up here, a first grower, who just – we sent him on a, an organic course, but he just couldn't get his head around it. You know, sometimes it's very difficult to change your mindset, and he just couldn't do that. So we decided we should come up here and do it ourselves. Um, yeah, so it, 
we were on a very, very steep learning curve, um, but it made life exciting as well. It was very interesting. I can tell you ever since we moved up here, it's always been very interesting. After lots of research, Helen realised that biodynamic farming not only helped improve the soil health, but it was a much more cost-effective way of farming too. We have 16,000 trees here and um, and we do it, at the pair of us, plus one full-time worker all year. Over winter, um, I, do, I make the biodynamic inputs and the most... Um, crucial thing is getting fresh cow manure so from cr- fresh cow manure and adding minerals and ground up eggshells and biodynamic preparations we make this very very rich humus which we then stir up in our flow form which is a series of five basins which firstly energizes the water and then we add the um, what's called cow pat pit <laughs> to our flow form and that then gets put out through sprinklers under the trees. So each tree has a sprinkler. We have a pump shed from which we can um, uh, put out these, these, these biodynamic inputs. Yeah, so it's it's easy, but it's it's complicated in the beginning. But it's become very very easy, and the more we do, the easier it becomes. So it's a yeah, it yeah, it's a very different way of thinking. I mean, a lot of a lot of producers put out bags of man made fertilizers. Well, we don't do that. We put out very little, but it's very potent. And so the more we do, the less we do. Achacha is not a common fruit in Australia. So when the first crop arrived, Helen took the opportunity to use the fruits of their labour as a marketing tool to garner interest and excitement. The very first year we got fruit, we were very excited. We, We got 700 fruit and we used that fruit to... Um, show it to all sorts of people, you know, uh, foodie people and people off the street and we asked them um, to describe the flavour of the fruit because we needed to have a way of describing the flavour. So um, all the answers we wrote down and a lot of them started by saying, well, it's a little bit lemony, a little bit passion fruity, a little bit peachy. And I said, well, could you describe it <clears throat> without referring to another fruit? And we wrote down all those answers. And the most common were sweet, tangy, refreshing, like a sorbet. And so those are the words we still use. When people ask what it tastes like, we say sweet, tangy, refreshing, like a sorbet. Finding an avenue to market proved a challenge at first, but they invested in educating young people to understand the fruit and do demonstrations in fruit shops and at farmers markets too. Well, we had to find some um, agents in the market and that took a while to find suitable people. Um, So we finally found agents in Sydney, Brisbane and Melbourne. Um, to whom we send the fruit. But then we needed to do demonstrations in fruit shops because from the from the agents, the, the retailers got their fruit. But who knew that fruit? Nobody. <laughs> so we spent a lot of time and energy training young people to go to uh, fruit shops to give people a taste of the fruit and to describe what it was like. But we also um, spent a lot of energy going to farmer's markets. And farmer's markets are fantastic because um, not only can you get the word out and and show the fruit, but then people buy it, so you get paid for advertising. (laughs) And the first one we started in Sydney was at Piermont. 
And when we went um, one Saturday in Piermont and then the people from Carriage Works Market invited us to have a stall at Carriage Works, which is a wonderful market. So we got in there the very the second year that they were operating, and then um, uh, and then we we went to a lot of different farmers markets, but we didn't have the we didn't have the manpower to do too many. So we did one north of the bridge and one south of the bridge. So, so we go to uh, Carriage Works Market south of the bridge and um, north. Sydney markets north of the bridge but uh, for the last couple of years we haven't been there due to COVID so it's been a bit difficult to to get down south so I've been I used to go every year down to Sydney when our harvest started and um, but the last couple of mark of years I haven't been able to do that so um, but it seems that the words got out sufficiently that people come begging for it. So the the agents have been c- c- calling for it, and we send a lot of uh, boxes off via the post by, via Australian Post Satchel to people who are living in remote areas on cattle farms or remote areas where they don't have retailers for the for the fruit. So we're just doing the best we can to get <laughs> to get it out to people. Fruit shops and farmers markets were one thing, but a rare chance to produce a video and have it air across the country soon opened many doors. Uh, well, look in the <laughs> there's a there's a a video on our website called the Trace. We had our neighbour in Sydney, who was actually our postman's son, who went to do went to TAFE to do a film course, and um, he was trying to get into a in trop, into Trop Fest, and he didn't make it. And he was so disappointed. We said to him, "Well, if we give you a little bit of money, could you make a f- fifteen second little video to show how to open the fruit because if you if you can even put a pin prick or your thumbnail in the ed- edge of the fruit it breaks the outside um, covering and then you can squeeze it um, either side and it pops open you pop it all around take the skin off and then you can get to the flesh anyway um he got all his friends that were working in, you know, different television stations and whatnot to, to get the best equipment, colour coding equipment, and they went for it and they, kept, they produced a th- just over three-minute l- video. <laughs> anyway, somehow or other, the guys who put on the ads in front of um, – uh, feature films got hold of it, and they said, well, "Look, we'll we'll put it on in eight cinemas for an enormous amount of money." We said, "Go away, we don't have that amount of money." And they came back and they'd lowered their price. We said, "We still don't have that amount of money. We haven't even put our fruit on the market yet." And um, so finally, they said, "We want that ad," and they offered us such a good price that that Bruce, my husband, wrote out a personal check and it went into um, eight cinemas before Christmas. That year we had our fruit before Christmas, including um, the IMAX, which was in Darling Harbour at that time. And it it was put, put on before Avatar. So we had an agreement to show the fil- the film for four weeks. Avatar went for 12 weeks and so did our, our ad. <laughs> and um, one night we went, we popped in to have a look at the people's reaction to that, that ad, which is really fun. Um, and there's a point where it's, it's about the conquistadors bringing fruit from South America here. And, um, and at one point, the guy jumps into off a cliff into the water and 
people were eating popcorn and drinking. And all of a sudden, when that happens, the whole place went silent. <laughs> and, um, and so it's been a very successful ad and it's still on our website if, you, if you're interested in seeing it. So it's called The Chase and, um, and, and that, that really got our fruit going. The harvest occurs during summer and requires a lot of hands and bodies to pick and pack all the fruit that's ready for market. Uh, well, this morning, all the pickers came in. They come in at 5.30. So we have about 20 pickers and we have uh, eight packers or I think it's about six or eight packers in the packing shed. So the pickers go out, they have five teams and a little trailer and they take out um, Dixies, which are, you know, those plastic bins and they pick into the Dixies and we have another man who goes out and collects the bins and brings them into the shed. So when there's sufficient fruit in the packing shed, the packers come in and they process that and it goes through. It's washed and dried and polished and it goes through on these little cups which is com- which are computer operated and they drop off at a certain weight. So we have extra large, large, medium. And then the packers put them into the appropriate size boxes and they're put in with a pamphlet and the lid goes on and then they go onto a packing onto a pallet of a hundred I think it's hundred and sixty six boxes. So they go into extra large, large and medium and then those pallets are put into our cool room, which is not very cool because it's a tropical fruit and it doesn't like the cold. Um, and then the trucks come in three times a week and take the pallets away and then they're sent to whoever has ordered them. They, the trucks go to a depot just down the road and then from there they're transferred to a truck that either goes to Sydney, Brisbane or Melbourne. And then they go to, for instance, in Sydney, they go to two agents in Flemington Market and uh, who have their regular customers and off they go. As with most fruit, our cha-cha is best served on its own. But many chefs have explored different presentations and uses. We, we tell people to eat it fresh, but the skin is very valuable. And we also suggest that people make a drink using the skin. So instead of throwing that out, we'll crunch it up, put it in water, it absorbs all the nutrients and it makes a good, uh, a good drink. Um, some chefs we've had have made sorbet from from the um, from the fruit, and we're, for years we've been trying to to get a machine to take the skin off the pulp. We can easily get the pulp off the seed, but we haven't found a way of getting the the skin off the pulp. If we could do that, we have we would have probably very big orders for the pulp. So, um, yes, some chefs have used it in their menus. Um, uh, Jared used it. We, we did a whole um, dinner with him early on in the piece and Justin North also put it on his menu. And, look, to tell you the truth, I don't know who else has used it. I know several have, but it's hard to find out. So, you know, once it leaves the plantation, it's taken in pallets of 166 boxes and it goes to Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and then this and overseas. So once it leaves the, you know, the farm gate, we have no idea who gets it and what they do with it. Interest in their fruit has not only been limited to Australia, with markets in Europe proving quite fruitful. There's a very huge food fair in Berlin and um, the people were taking mangoes to that fruit fair asked if they could take a few boxes of our fruit and that was years ago and um, it made a bit of a hit in Europe that was the first time it had been seen in Europe 
And then the next year they invited us to go into the Innovation Award. And it's the Innovation Award is, you know, I don't know, hundreds. They have hundreds of entries and they name 12 people. And we were named part of the Innovation Award the next year. And we were given a little tiny table. And uh, my son, who lives in Europe, came and I flew over and we just stood there and showed people our fruit. And from that little table, we got into Marks and Spencers in London. And we got on BBC Two with Jay Rayner. I don't know if you know him. Um, and so, you know, these are the really interesting, fun things that, that we've been able to do over the years. For now, Helen is focused on building the awareness and reputation of this amazing tropical fruit. But she sees opportunities in value-add products down the track. Look, there's a lot of potential, but we just don't have the finances to be able to, to do that, to get the drink going and to get the machine made, to get the pulp. So probably the next people that come will <laughs> can do that. You know, I we went we used, used to go every year to a, a tropical fruit festival in Innisfail called Feast of the Senses. And um, it's all about tropical fruit, and it's terrific. But, of course, with COVID, we haven't been up there for the last few years. But one year, um, they had a dinner, and we sat at a table, and Bob Catter walked in, and he looked a bit lo lost. So Bruce said, oh, here, Bob, we've got a seat for you. <laughs> and he sat down, and he went round the whole table, and he knew people. He knew that guy's uncle was a taxi driver and he knew that person. And then when he came to us, he said, and what do you fellas do? And we explained to it him. And he said, laughed, you know, with his Bob Catter laugh. And he said, I've got three pieces of, of, of uh, advice for you. One, never be a pioneer. Two, never be a pioneer. Three, never be a pioneer because pioneers do all the hard work and the next people come in and make all the money. <laughs> and I think he's right. <laughs> the move into growing Achacha has been life changing for Helen. Not just being on the land, but the impact it has on those that consume it too. Producing healthy, nutrient dense food for people is. A wonderful thing and that's what we do <laughs> we spend all winter working on the soil and then comes the harvest and we're busy right now picking and packing and sending off the fruit the rewards from our labor what surprised us how excited people get when they think they're the very first people to discover this fruit <laughs> so we we have people um who who try it and they said, oh, we've never seen that before and they get quite excited about it. Helen and Bruce never imagined they'd become producers, but the move into growing one of the world's most fascinating tropical fruits has not only been personally rewarding, but opened up a culinary experience for so many all over the globe. This is The Producers, a Deep in the Weeds production. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of producers, farmers, makers and growers, the true lifeblood of the food industry. Follow us on Instagram at Producers Podcast or email us at producerspodcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Cha-cha.